What's going on, everybody? And welcome in to the best of 3C Media from 2022. It's been an amazing, fun year full of growth that's also mass over 2.2K followers on TikTok, 100 subscribers on YouTube, and 200 episodes of the Crash Course podcast. Today, we'll take a look back at some of the segments and videos you guys enjoyed from the past year. Let's get started. First up, we'll take you back to a time where there was still some hope for the 2022 Indianapolis Colts. Matt Ryan was benched in favor of Sam Ellinger, and B. Scott and I discussed the implications of that move. Enjoy the most watched YouTube video from this past year. Let's talk some Indianapolis Colts. The Indianapolis Colts have a new QB1 as on Monday, a day after the Colts 19-10 loss to the Tennessee Titans, putting their AFC South chances on live support. I would also just probably say effectively ending their chances to win the AFC South. Uh, Frank Reich named Sam Ellinger the quarterback versus the Washington Commanders uh, for this Sunday. Matt Ryan is out with a shoulder injury, uh, though Reich said that Ellinger will start even when Ryan is healthy. So um, some big news uh, as far as the Indiana, Indianapolis Colts go. And, you know, I will say this. Um, I think it's it's I think it's a bit forced because of the how the season has worked out so far, but it is nice to see some accountability uh, being had in the Colts organization. Like I said a couple of weeks ago, um, I don't mind losing as long as there's a plan, um, and it's nice to see Indy finally admit things that you know things aren't fine and dandy. Like we are, the path, we're not still on the right path. We're not still you know you know right th- on the cusp of where we think we should be. Actually, yeah, we do have some problems. We need to address those problems it is nice to see that finally being addressed uh in the Colts organizations I do hate it for Matt Ryan um I do like him uh you know I was a fan of his when he played at Boston College um you know that was years you know one of the craziest years you know back when the BCS was crazy and you had Boston College as like the number two team in the country for a little bit uh you know so they lost to Florida State and all all that went out the window. But um, that was the year West Virginia almost made it to the BCS championship until they lost a bit yeah. like in the last week. Honestly, I forgot that Pat McAfee was like basically the reason why they lost until he like addressed it right before Pitt and West Virginia West Virginia played this past season. Um but yeah, I, I get, you know, there are issues with the weapons in the offensive line, but you know, Ryan with as you know, with, you know, all the sacks, all the turnovers is just as – I mean, you can say all you want about the offensive line and weapons. I mean, you can't have that many turnovers. You can't have that many sacks. You can't have all he's, these – He was rated – out of the 34 QBs that have played this year, he's rated like 31. Yeah. And there's only 32 teams. So, like, 32 teams in the NFL, and he's rated 31. Yeah. That's – yeah. I mean – it's tough because you saw what he is capable of against um, the Jacksonville Jaguars and leading that comeback where he had no turnovers in the game. And it was like, okay, maybe we found something, but then to come out and just completely lay an egg. Yes, I know he has a separated shoulder now, but like Frank Reich said, regardless of the injury, the change was going to be made. Um, so I, it's a good. I think it's a good move. I don't know. Yeah, what do you yeah. Think? I think yeah. I think you know. You'd like to believe that you know Ryan's production was going to eventually improve, uh, but there's just no more time to wait. And Ellinger, no. Ellinger has shown a lot of potential in the preseason, so I'm excited. I mean, if we were going to Ellinger, kind of like sight unseen was kind of because I mean I remember when Jacob Eason. Uh, was still, you know, we thought maybe it was Eason season uh, for the Indianapolis Colts. Um, you know, we were even saying, I know there was a couple preseason games where we were like, actually, you know, I think I'd rather see Ellinger more than I'd like to see Eason as the starting quarterback. So um, I, I think, you know, I, I know there are some people that think that this move means the Colts season is uh, effectively done. I honestly don't believe that because that's how much I don't. I, that's how much potential I see in Sam Ellinger. So I, I, it was the right move. You can't wait anymore because I, I think, I think, I think this was. You know, we we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. You know, the Colts needed to win these next two games. Uh, you know, or else there was going to be changes. And yes, at the time we were talking about much larger changes with potentially seeing the end of Ballard and Reich early. But I think that, you know, Matt Ryan was brought in to help the Colts, you know, take that next step, win the AFC South, make the postseason. Now that the AFC South is pretty much out the window and the playoffs are on life support, 
I think this is the perfect time to make that change. All right, you know what, Matt? You were brought in to do a thing. You didn't do the thing. So now we got to make changes. So I, I like the move, and I really uh, think the Colts have potential in uh, Sam Ellinger. Yeah, I, I do too. I I have seen a lot of people say this is like the Colts essentially waving the white flag. I don't think that's the case fully because there is still a chance Sam Ellinger comes in and performs the way we've seen him perform in the preseason, and the Colts go on a miniature run and get themselves into the wild card hunt. It, it, it's still possible for that to happen. And I've also seen people say, by starting Sam Ellinger, the, it's basically Chris Ballard and Frank Reich saying, we have failed. Again, I don't know if that's... I can't buy into that 100% either because, look, they were both really high on Ellinger. They chose to draft him. Um he kind of fits more into the mold of what you want at a quarterback now. Oh, but he's short. Yeah, well, so is Russell Wilson, and that's not a good example anymore. Andrew Brees, I mean. Kyler Murray. Kyler, well, I mean, yeah, Kyler Murray, Case Keenum. But it's he, the fact that he's mobile, I think it's going to add bring an added dimension to the Colts a little bit. Yes, the offensive line isn't all of a sudden going to get better. But you don't have a statue standing back there anymore. You have somebody that pocket breaks down. He can extend the play with his legs, allow some of these receivers to get open a little bit more. And because of that, it's going to have to cause the secondary to respect the ability for him to run. You know, it's gonna, it, They're going to have to keep an eye on that, which is when you have that, you end up having a QB spy. So then you end up having somebody that, is not dropping back. Somebody else is not dropping back into coverage too much. So it, it, it has the potential to jumpstart this team, which I think is the right move. But it also helps the Colts that if, let's say it doesn't, or you know, if it doesn't work, okay, now we know Sam Ellinger is not the option. Sam Ellinger is not the guy of the, moving forward. Where the Colts are at right now is they need to see, are we going after a QB in the draft? Are we going to have a high draft pick, a low draft pick? Where, you know, how is this going to unfold? It kind of gives them a better sense of what their future could look like and which direction they need to go. If Sam Ellinger comes out and plays lights out and revitalizes this team, gets them going, then it's like, okay, we actually have our guy now. This is our guy. He's a young guy. I mean, he's only, his cap hit is only like, 927,000 I think next year give or take 20 like 20,000 dollars but it's like okay that's a great piece to build around if if it works out if it doesn't then yeah you know okay we we need to look for a quarterback whether that is free agency not the option in my opinion honestly the Indy Star put out an article the other day um or just recently on the QB options that are going to be out there this next off season. And unless the Colts are in a position to draft CJ Stroud or even Bryce young, I'm not as high on Bryce young as I am CJ Stroud. I it's, it's a really, it's not a great outlook for the quarterbacks. I mean, they're like, well, Geno Smith could be available and he's really turned it around or Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be a free agent. And I'm like, does that really help to either one of those guys fix the problem? I, I don't think so. Tom Brady is going to be available. Oh, come on. Stop. <laughs> Maybe two years ago, if, that would have been exciting, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, I, I, I think it's the right move because if the season does, can, if it goes South with Ellinger at QB one. Okay. We know our, we know our plan. If it go, if it takes off, okay. Now we don't need to spend that first round pick on a quarterback or trying to get into a position to get a good quarterback. We can fill the other holes that we have on this team. So it's a good move. I, if they came out and said Nick Foles is now QB one, <laughs> that's waving the white flag. Yeah, that's saying we have no idea what we're doing. We're we're on our way out. We're going to crash the plane on the way down. Yeah. Essentially, by going with Ellinger, it says it, it, it does. It, it kind of it. It's the right move. 
it because it, it does help them f- answer questions that they may have. Well, and I mean, I like he, it. Yeah. I, and then I, 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 I was high on Ellinger coming out of Texas as well. He's one of those guys. He knows how to win. Is he going to light up the stat sheet like a Peyton Manning? Look, I've gone down this road several times, and this is a hill I am willing to die on for a lot of quarterbacks. A lot of quarterbacks get passed over in this league because they don't put up the Tom Brady or Peyton Manning or Drew Brees-esque numbers. They don't. But some guys have this ability. Yeah, Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Peyton Manning had that ability to also will their team to victory. That was... That's one thing. You're not, it's hard to come across those types of guys year in and year out in the draft. There, you, if you really want to be a good, solid team, you need to find yourself a quarterback, in my opinion. Yeah, if you have the ability to get a generational talent, you go for it. But if not, you need to find a guy that knows how to just play winning football. Well, I mean, you're seeing and it with the is, you're seeing it with the Giants with Daniel Jones. I mean, I don't think I think that's kind know, of surprising though, yeah. because they were ready to cut him. Well, right, um, but I'm just saying that like I think yeah. You know, well, we but have, like, like the Tim Tebow thing. Yeah, I, everybody's like, oh, he had a funky throwing motion. It's like no, I think people didn't like him anymore because the media circus that followed him. Uh, be, because I don't know why the media just loved to hate on him, but yet they just loved to follow him. And nobody wanted that circus. But the thing was, Tebow knew how to win. And yeah. that's just that's an ability that's just overlooked because, oh, he's not putting up Pro Bowl numbers. Who cares? If my quarterback goes out there and is puts up just average numbers, but the win loss total is is really good, we're in the playoffs and we're we're advancing in the playoffs. That's what I want to see. I don't care if he's out there throwing single season records for touchdowns yeah. uh, it's uh, that, that's 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 the hill i'm willing to die on and i feel like ellinger has that potential is he going to be a pro bowl quarterback i i don't think so is he going to be a hall of famer i no, he's not but is he going to be a quarterback that can get your team victories win you games advance you through the playoffs i believe he can yeah well and and you touched on you know what might happen the rest of the season. I mean, you know, I do think there are five uh, games that are winnable for the Colts the rest of the way. You know, we talked about the Commanders. We, t- uh, I think the Patriots, especially after what they did um, against the Bears on Monday night, um, I think that's a, a you know a winnable game. The Raiders are you know in a funk. The Steelers are in a funk. The Chargers, who knows what Chargers uh, team you're going to get? The Texans, I think, is a winnable game. All the, all these teams that I mentioned are very hot. Uh-huh. Can't, um, can't say the Texans is a winnable game. Well, I'm just saying that. Wait, you know, wait. <laughs> well, I okay. I will say it is winnable because we would have beaten them had we had a better kicker at the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, if they if that all if they win all of those games, that would put them at eight eight and one. If they can snag a win away from the Eagles, Vikings, Cowboys, or Giants, then they might be able to still snag a wild card spot. Although that means uh, a likely one and done in the playoffs with either the uh, Bills or the Chiefs on the road. Um, a playoff Which run is fine, right? Um, you know, a playoff run is obviously the best case uh, scenario at the moment. But, um, you know, I think Ellinger's success or failure, you know, like you mentioned, does drive the future of this organization at the moment. Because if the Colts can rally, I think Reich and Ellinger uh, at least are back. Um, if the Colts fall apart, I think all three are gone, Reich, Ballard, and Ellinger. Uh, and which is, you know, this is almost coming at the perfect time because then, you know, as these all, all – if all three are out – then you'll have a new co a, G- a new GM that will be able to pick you know his new coach and quarterback. Um, you know as far as um, you know the future, um, you know at quarterback and the future of the franchise. Now I will say this: you said there's no really other you know quarterbacks that you'd want outside of C.J. Stroud um, and uh, um, Bryce Young. I will Bryce say Young. I I've heard ooh Hinden Hooker. I forgot about Hinden Hooker. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, he's, I can, he's completely ranked, spaced on that one. <laughs> right now, he is ranked by Pro Football Focus as the 49th overall prospect, and the, obviously that would mean the Colts would pick he's somewhere like, in there. Right now, the Heisman favorite. Right, and I think the Colts would be a good landing spot. I'm just saying. Now, I I have I've also seen people high on like Will Levis or we Levis. I'm not. Yeah, stop. Out of Levis. Will Levis. Yeah. Stop. Just no. Um, but is this, uh, the, this is the guy that was like, looked pedestrian again. It looked horrible against Ole Miss. Yeah. 
So, but yeah, Hendon Hooker, I think would be like, I yeah, would, I completely I would, spaced on him. I would love to see that happen. So I, I think this is all kind of happening at the right time because, you know, the, the entire, you know, the, the guys at the top of the organization, you know, Ursay especially is kind of reevaluating. Um, and this could be a opportunity if, if things were to go south with Ellinger to be like, all right, we're wiping the sl- slate clean. We're bringing in a, a new, because uh, that's always the messy thing. Because when you hire a you know a new coach, but not a new GM, or vice versa, or have like a quarterback already in place, like that new coach is like, or new GM or whatever is like, oh, that's not my guy. I kind of want to bring in my guy. If you have a chance to bring in all three at the same time, I, I think that's you know the the right moment to do it. All right, so hear me out here. This kind of just feels like there's something that this this could really take off. I, I, I'm th- with you. This is this is like the mo of our show here. Let's just follow me. So the Colts were pretty bad in the mid '90s. Would you agree? Yes. Early mid '90s. Then out of nowhere, this unknown quarterback wearing number four infused some life into the Colts for a little bit. Got them through until the Colts screw jacked around and lost him which ultimately ended up leading to a generational talent with the last name of Manning. A, a quarterback from the University of Tennessee where Hendon Hooker plays. No. <laughs> Listen, hear, hear me out. <laughs> hear me out. Oh, I Sam see I know where you're going, yeah. Sam Ellinger wears number four. Sam Ellinger can be serviceable for a couple years before the Colts screw Jack around and screw it up. Landing the Colts in a position to draft another once in a generation potential talent from Texas, from Texas, the University of Texas, with the last name of Manning. Yeah, I, I like that. With idea. A, but with the potential of having a wide receiver on the roster already with the last name of Harrison. That dude, if that I, if that I happens... mean it, it could happen. <laughs> it could happen. But I mean when I see Sam Ellinger donning that number four, I'm like I get flashbacks of Jim Harbaugh. Yeah. yeah. Coming That's out there, call. the comeback kid. I mean, it just, I don't know, like a comeback on the season led by number four at quarterback. It, it just seems a little too. Perfect. Like, like it, it, it's, it, but it's also <laughs> that type of like rabbit hole that this show it goes down. Yeah. And like and goes. Usually that's me. Yeah, so I'm very really impre- I'm very impressed by uh by Yeah, uh, you're that. the one making those correlations, not me, yeah. but <laughs> I'm I'm usually the like, yeah, let's not go down that hole because yeah. that's unrealistic. But it's it's a legit like Sam Ellinger could be the stopgap for a while, just go through a couple bad seasons and all of a sudden, bam, we have Manning at quarterback again. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a very real possibility. I mean, then, because you you can also still have you can still get Marvin Harrison. Yeah, and Jr. hey, here in a few years you you can get uh you know T Y Hilton's kid out of Zionsville. You can get he's got to go to Purdue first, right? He's got to he's got to accept that Purdue scholarship. Uh, as a Vin, isn't Vinatieri's kid going to Ball State or where's he going? Uh, I thought he went to UMass. Maybe he did, but he's a yeah. tight end though. I thought Vinatieri's kid is a kicker. Uh, I thought one of his. I thought yeah, maybe he is. Yeah, yeah. But see, we can just we can know. just have the second generation of all the Colts we love to watch growing up. <laughs> I mean, it's not. I could say, that, that's the thing. Like I could see Ursa pushing for that type of stuff too, because I mean, he is that he's like a sentimental type owner. That is true. That is true. Um, before we get out of here, uh, I do want to make a bold prediction, um, you know, for this Sunday. Cause I, you know, I think you and I are both on the same page. We both think that, you know, this is the right move. We both think that, the, you know, the winning, the, this could be a winning move for the Colts. This isn't a punt by any stretch of the imagination. We could be wrong. We could be back here talking about how the Colts went three, 13 and one. You never know. But Hey, um, like I said, <laughs> it's, it is, it, it helps the Colts figure out which direction they go in in the off season. Yeah. I like, sure. That's why I think it, that's why I like the move. I don't think it's a punt, but at the same time, I think it also helps them figure out their roadmap. Yeah. 
So a bold prediction for this Sunday um, where Ellinger will make his first start against the Commanders. Uh, I think Ellinger throws three touchdown passes, and it's a Colts win. Uh, there have been seven games during the Colts rent a quarterback era where the quarterback has thrown three touchdown passes. Six of those seven have come at Lucas Oil Stadium where the game is going to be played uh, this Sunday. Um, the stadium is going to be rowdy. They'll be behind Ellinger. I mean, see the kind of reception that uh, Bailey Zappi got when he came in for Mac Jones on Monday Night Football. Um, I think it's going to be that kind of reaction for Ellinger, especially if he does well really quickly. I think the stadium will be absolutely all in full force. Uh, on oh, Sam yeah. Ellinger, and I think the kid feeds on that, and I think Ellinger, uh, the Ellinger era gets off to a crazy start, so I think Ellinger has a big game, because, I mean, it's kind of fitting, we, we see this happen a few times in sports where there's that crazy thing that happens, and yeah, sure, there may it, it may, you know, not be anything, and just be kind of a fluke game, or it could be the start of something great, so I think that it's going to be just an, an incredible electric start uh, to the Sam Ellinger era. I agree. I think so I'm going to go one step further. I think he also, I mean, one, I wish Carson Wentz was playing in this game for more reasons than one, but um, I'm going to add another tidbit to the uh, Ellinger prediction. I think he breaks a touchdown run of greater than 50 yards. He, he How many times did he do that in the preseason? Like two or three times? I mean, yeah, it's different in the preseason, but we're still talking about the Washington Commanders here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think if he breaks one for more than 20 or 30 yards, the roof of Lucas Oil Stadium will blow off. So, Jim Ursay, you better open the roof up on Sunday because, I don't know, actually keep it closed. I, th- that makes it even better. Yeah, the crowd noise. That oh, yeah i could see this i could see this being like i was like oh it'd be a fun game to go to and because the colts are like, people think the colts are waving the white flag and the commanders no longer have went starting tickets are going to be uber cheap <laughs> fans are excited about the ellinger era beginning and tickets are really expensive for this game and going fast according to StubHub, they said get your tickets quick because this one's going away quickly so fans are excited they need they wanted to see some change they got it here we go finally one of my favorite segments from 2022 was when we honored the late john madden with a cover athlete draft from his legendary video game drop your winner from that draft in the comment section below and enjoy the most listened to podcast segment from this past year um, but, uh, so let's go ahead and get into our, uh, cover athlete drafts. Speaking of, uh, being on the cover. Um, and, uh, so how it's going to work is it's going to be a snake draft. We're going to do five rounds. You have to pick a quarterback, a running back, a wide receiver, a flex. So it can be a running back, wide receiver, or a tight end. Um, because I think there's going to be some left over of all of those. Um, and then a defense, there are exactly three defenses. So that's, uh, what the great thing is. So as far as, um, Quarterbacks go, you can pick from Dante Culpepper, 2002, was when he was on the cover. Michael Vick, who was on the cover of 04. Donovan McNabb, who was on the cover of 2006. Uh, Vince Young, who was on the cover of Madden 2008. Brett Favre, who was on the cover of Madden 2009. Uh, Drew Brees, who was on the cover of Madden 2011. Uh, B. Scott's a Purdue fan, so I'm sure we all know who where he's going with that. Uh, Tom Brady uh, was on the cover in 2018 and 2022. Patrick Mahomes was on the cover in 2020 and 2022 and Lamar Jackson was on the cover of Madden 2021. As far as running backs go, uh, Eddie George um, was uh, on the cover in 2001. As B. Scott said, Marshall Falk was on the cover of 2003. Sean Alexander was on the cover in 2007. Peyton Hillis had that really weird year where he was on the cover in 2002, uh, 2012. And then Barry Sanders was on the cover of uh, Madden 2014. Fun fact, that was called Madden 25, not Madden 14. Um, and then you had, uh, from wide receivers, you have Larry Fitzgerald, who was on the cover in 2010, Calvin Johnson, who was on the cover in 2013, Odell Beckham Jr., who was on the cover of 2016, and Antonio Brown, who was on the cover of 2019. Uh, then there is only one tight end that ever graced the cover. That's Rob Gronkowski in 2017. And then as far as defenses are concerned, you have Ray Lewis, who will represent the Ravens defense. That was 2005. Troy Palomalu, who, who, um, 
uh, represents the Steelers in 2010, and then Richard Sherman, who represents the Seahawks in 2015. So it is going to be a snake draft, so whoever has the third pick will uh, pick in the first and the second round and so on and so forth. So anybody have a preference on first pick? I was going to go cards, uh, you know, Cards Against Humanity rules, and uh, whoever pooped last uh, gets to go gets to go first. Um, but uh, it's just kind of what you guys want to do. We didn't really discuss this in the in the pre-show production aspect of things. Craig, I guess since you're running the show, who is the top box on Who's number one here? Who a lot of pressure, <laughs> a lot of pressure for me. But I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go ahead and go. Uh, I'll go ahead and go first. Then. Um, all right. So. First pick of the draft uh, for me, and it may be controversial at 1-1, but uh, I think as far as value goes, there's only four of these position in the draft. Um, and so I, th- I think it's good to go ahead and lock up your number one. And because he's the cover of my favorite version of the game, or at least the most recent version of the game that I actually like enjoyed and played a ton of, I'm going to go with OBJ uh, the, on the cover of 2016. Oh. That is my 1-1. One, one. Only four wide receivers in the draft. Remember that. <laughs> so, That's who you took first. Yes, and- Odell Beckham Jr. I mean, hey, look, y- when you make a draft, you have to go with your heart and you have to take who you don't think is going to come back to you. I know that, and, you know, and remember, I don't have a pick again until the end of the second round. So I didn't know if OBJ <laughs> would last that long. Uh, so I'm going Odell Beckham Jr. Uh, of course, Grace is the cover, cover after, um, you know, that incredible catch against the Cowboys. I think that was, I don't, was that on a Sunday night game? I think. Um, I think so. I think Madden yeah. was calling it. Uh, wouldn't have been in, no. well, maybe. Wouldn't have been in 14. Maybe. Maybe. I know. No, that would have been Collinsworth because Collinsworth, I think, called Sunday night oh. like when we were still in college. So, yeah. But uh, I- anyway, I mean, yeah. O- so OBJ- I probably had it on mute. And remember, I mean, <laughs> this is this is prime OBJ. This isn't, you know, current OBJ. So, I mean, that's that still warrants some. I know maybe not ever. Obviously, not everyone's one one, but uh, I think it's still solid one one. I feel like we should get a, a a good Chris Collinsworth impersonator on here and. Uh, <laughs> Tell us, recall that that catch for us. All right, so who's two on your screen? Since you're keeping track of this, my two. Oh, I was see. I'm the second person on my screen. If we're going like one, two, three, four, or one. Okay, you, so <laughs> we'll you, let you go second then. Yeah, B Scott, you can go second. <laughs> all right. Well, as Craig said, I'm a homer. We all know that. So my number one pick, I'm going with a a quarterback. I'm going to go with one of the all-time leading quarterbacks in the NFL. Well, until, you know, Tom Brady's already passed him because Tom Brady is never going to retire. But I'm going with Drew Brees from 2011. Um, You know, he had a great year that season. And, you know, when I look at some of my favorite games, uh, Drew Brees is right there. I remember playing with... Drew Brees, I think it was back in, I want to say like 04 or 05, um, I would change up the uh, the depth chart with the San Diego Chargers and have Drew Brees as my, oh no, it was much earlier than that then because he was on his way to the Saints at that point. But yeah, right when he first started his career in the NFL, I would change up the depth chart with the Chargers so that way he would be the quarterback. Good pick. Good pick. All right. So, uh, yeah, you guys both picked guys that weren't even on my like top three at either of their positions. I thought you were going to so. say you're on your board. And I was like, we all have the same board. Yeah. How are you, no, I'm going to take they're not even, not even <laughs> on my board. I don't, I don't even know where you guys got those dudes from, but yeah, not even on my board. But yeah. OBJ. I thought a lot about OBJ. I mean, he had three like fantastic seasons starting off, but I, I wasn't so sure about picking him. He is actually fourth on my wide receiver list, but, <laughs> um, but no, uh, I was going to go, uh, you guys went wide receiver and QB. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, throw a running back out there. I'm going to go the guy that they picked after 25 years of Madden here. So I'm going to go with Barry Sanders and uh, lock him in as my running back there. I mean, he had, you know, the, the 2k season uh, 2000 rushing yards in a season. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then also, I mean, he only played 10 seasons. He, he kind of went out on top. I mean, he didn't, he, he kind of quit before uh, the wheels fell off. So, uh, but no, I'm going to go with Barry Sanders. He's going to be my running back. All right. Perfect. You get the first pick around too. And Barry Sanders first, is not a very friendly person. Just FYI. Yeah. FYI. Okay. 
Especially <laughs> when you have a friend that is with you and you're seeing him and he, you, your friend calls him uh, Gail Sayers. Ooh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that'll that'll do it. That'll do it. <laughs> oh, geez. Oh, geez. That'll that'll do it. I'll I'll make a mental note to never never call him Gail Sayers to his face. So that's his um, <laughs> only behind his back. <laughs> only behind his back. <laughs> you know who that guy is? Gail Sayers. Gail Sayers. That wasn't Barry <laughs> Sanders. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh man. So uh RB round one, and then I'll go uh for QB. Actually, uh probably my favorite uh player to play was uh Michael Vick. So I'll go Michael Vick round two, pick one, um, cover of uh the year uh Oh, four. Um, I was just looking up stuff. He has like over 6,000 rushing yards in his career, seven yards per carry. I, I don't know. I mean, if you ran him on every single down in Madden, you could probably get like 25 yards per carry just in, in the game. So that's, that's my second pick right there. So for my second pick, I'm going wide receiver. And this is the guy I thought Craig was going to pick when he was talking about a wide receiver in the first round, I'm going with Calvin Johnson. I mean, can you imagine the type of numbers that Calvin Johnson and Drew Brees would put up together? <laughs> wow. I mean, yeah. that that's, yeah. yeah I mean, pretty... that, it had to be uh, <laughs> one heck of a duo. I mean, think about it. Calvin Johnson put up like Hall of Fame t- type numbers with Matthew Stafford as his quarterback. Just think of what he could do with a Drew Brees. Right. Oh, yeah. He's the only, uh, I think he's the only person on this list that I've actually seen live. I actually saw Calvin Johnson when he played for Georgia Tech at a bowl game uh, when he played up against West Virginia. And uh, I think he had like 53 catches, like a thousand yards and 10 touchdowns in that game. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty crazy. <laughs> seen Drew right, Brees live. Maybe, maybe, no, no, Calvin Johnson. I saw Calvin, Calvin Johnson. Yeah, he was, he was pretty crazy against West Virginia. All right, so I've got two picks in a row here, so I'm going to go ahead and go a little bit more close to the vest uh, with this selection, Um, and I'm going to go with my running back. I'm going to go ahead and nab Marshall Falk, uh, one of my favorite players. Uh, Have one of – it's weird. I don't think the Rams ever wore this jersey, but I have them – or I used to have. It doesn't fit me anymore, but a gold – uh, Rams number 28 Marshall Falk jersey. So that's pretty cool. Um, you know, again, like you said, B Scott, you had like an agreement with your friends to not use uh, the Rams, uh, just, you know, an electric player. Um, and then also played for the Colts at one point. Uh, so that's pretty cool too. So, um, you know, just was a, was a special running back to watch. Um, and so I'm going to go Marshall Falk with the last pick of the second round. And then, um, I guess I'll go. I'll go quarterback here. I was thinking about I'll go ahead and nab my flex here just because I want the uh, I want I want the I, I want to have a specific player on my team. Uh, but uh, we'll see if he drops to me again in the last two picks of the draft. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and get my quarterback here, and I'm gonna go ahead and get Lamar Jackson. Um, the reason why I want Lamar Jackson is because whenever I've played Madden, um, or even when I've played college football, my favorite thing to do is to call a, uh, you know, four verticals. So everyone runs go routes and then I roll my quarterback to one direction or the other. And if there's a wide open receiver, then I'll throw it or I'll just tuck it and run because the AI is thinking pass. So then you can just tuck it and run and run, you know, 20, 25 yards, like you were saying about Vic, Dan. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's always a lot of fun. So I thought about, you know, if I, I didn't, you know, there was other co- quarterbacks I considered. I thought about Donovan McNabb since I, I just, I don't know. That's one of the first Madden games I remember playing. Um, I enjoyed, you know, playing, you know, with Donovan McNabb. I thought about him too. I thought about Patrick Mahomes too, uh, but he's on 20 and 22 and I didn't really play any either of those games that often. So I'm going to go ahead and even though I didn't play 21 either, but that's beside the point. Uh, I'm going to go with Lamar Jackson and put him on the team. No, no, Tom Brady selected the greatest quarterback to ever play the game. Uh, True, it's kind of kind of surprising. But, but like, it's just <laughs> or, those, or is that Drew Brees? Yes. Well, it's it's fun to play with uh, you know guys like Jackson, Mahomes, guys that have mobility yeah. because you can do so much more. I feel like. Yeah, I always loved a mobile quarterback in uh, Madden. I I didn't matter uh, who it was, like who's <laughs> if even if you'd have Tom Brady, I'd, I'd always pick a mobile quarterback. Oh yeah. All right, B. Scott, you're up. No, Craig, it's you again. I, I made my two picks. Oh, you did. Okay. You, were you not listening, Brandon? Get those <laughs> off. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm following along with the 
the board as it's being updated. Oh, yeah. I'm well, I wasn't it. updating it because I was talking, so I'll, it'll gotcha. be updated now. So, yeah, you know, know what? I'm going to go ahead and take my flex player because I have a feeling this is who Craig was going after. <laughs> yeah. And I am taking Rob Gronkowski. Yeah. Oh, with my pick in the third round, I mean, just the athleticism for a tight end, the strength, the size, pairing him along with Calvin Johnson with Drew Brees throwing to both of them. That good luck covering that. Man, you guys are uh pick pick my flex there. Am I am I next yeah. here? Yeah, yeah, you're you're next. Okay, all right. I I'll go I'll run defense there. Uh kind of the obvious choice if anybody knows me. Uh, I'm gonna go uh be a homer here and pick Troy Palomalu as my uh defender here. Uh, big Pittsburgh Pittsburgh fan growing up around that area. So, I mean, he could do it all. He's kind of like a, a bit of a linebacker. He played close close uh, to the line of scrimmage there for a long time. And then later on in his career, it seemed like he kind of played a little bit further back, was more a cover safety, but could do it all. I think the, the thing that sticks in my mind is him just leaping over the line and like blocking field goals or sacking quarterbacks. Uh, I like seeing him do that all the time. But, uh, yeah, going to go with Twig Palomale for my uh, defender. And then you got, picks around? Yeah, you get the first pick of the Goodness fourth round. Goodness gracious. I know. All right, first pick of the fourth round. All right. Um, I'm going to go with uh, – let me see here. What was I going to go with? Oh, for uh, flex, I was going to go with uh, Eddie George. You guys picked a couple of my flex there. But I'll go with Eddie George. Um, he didn't have a great career yards per carry, but – um, but I'm, I'm going to go with Eddie George as my, uh, backup running back there. Uh, he had, you know, pretty, pretty good overall career. Plus is one of the earlier Maddens where, uh, they had a, a cover athlete there. So go with Eddie George for my flex position. So for me, I need to pick a running back and my running back was just picked. Oh, um, geez. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, a, wait, never mind. Never mind. Go ahead. Sorry. I thought you had, I do not Sanders. have a running back. Um, you know, it, this is a tough one, but I think I'm going to go with Sean Alexander okay. because Sean Alexander wasn't just a good running back. He just was a good teammate. People love playing with him. I think if it wasn't for him, I don't think the Seahawks would have made a Super Bowl back. Oh, gosh. What year was it? Like 2005, I think, or six against yeah. the Steelers. Yeah, against the Steelers in Detroit, where, I mean, they were completely outmatched in that game. But, you know, he was just one of those guys you could always root for. And you got to have a you got to have a guy like that on your team, especially when you to level things out with Rob Gronkowski. Speaking of uh, that Super Bowl against the Steelers, that was Ben Roethlisberger's first Super Bowl. Oh, no. Dan, you, do you, you have any reaction? What was your thoughts last night during uh, Roethlisberger's last game? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So got to fortunately was able to watch the whole game. Um yeah, I mean it was good. It was it was a good final game. I mean, I I I hope that you know they somehow sneak into the playoffs, but I think that would have to be at the expense of the Colts if that were to happen. But uh, no, it was it was good watching Ben. I mean, he's been you know basically my quarterback for 18 years now, I think. But uh, I, I mean, went through some Neil O'Donnell years, Cordell Stewart years, uh, Mike Tom Zach years. So so. Uh, you know, fortunate to have some good teams over the years, but uh, no, with Ben Roethlisberger, he's definitely the best best quarterback I've I've been able to watch with the Steelers, and it was it was fun. It was fun watching him win the game. I mean, it was he was definitely being pretty emotional there for a while, and then uh, all of a sudden it looked like oh maybe this game's going to be a little bit closer than what we thought towards the end, but uh, they were able to sneak it out. Najee Harris with that big run towards the end was kind of the the nail in the coffin. So, but it was good. I, I enjoyed the, enjoyed the game. We're definitely going to miss them. And I think we're going to probably have about 10 years of uh, mediocrity here now. <laughs> Surprise. No, uh, Tommy Maddox. Uh, oh yeah. You know, Tommy Maddox. Going yeah. <laughs> that was this yeah. kind of, the kind of random. Well, yeah. Like what one season a starter? Or did he just start like yeah. two games before Roethlisberger started? Yeah. He had one season where they were basically like an air raid offense. And I mean, they were just kind of throwing it like crazy. And then uh, he got hurt. I think game two, of uh, Roethlisberger's rookie season. Roethlisberger lost that game against the the Ravens, but after that he won 14 games. So um, I think, I think they went like 14 and two that year, 15 and one that year and uh, went to the AFC championship game and lost against the Patriots, I think. 
Yeah. All right. I've got two back-to-back picks here. My final two picks of the draft. Um, so I can lock up my flex and I can lock up my defense. And I'm going to go defense first. I'm going to go with the Ravens defense, um, you know, because with uh, Ray Lewis, uh, mostly because I think uh, Madden two, 2005 was the first version of Madden where they introduced the, like, I don't even know what you would call it. If it's, it's a technically a mechanic or what you would call it, but where if you hit a player hard enough, their helmet would fly off. Uh, oh, okay. And that was that That's was like pretty the hit cool, stick, right? Right, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, you know, I know that those kind of hits are are taboo now, and and you know that you know kind of, but it was kind of a of a uh, you know emblem of the times. Um, you know of that, and plus Ray Lewis, um, you know, just one of the greatest you know linebackers that well, at least we've seen during our time, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, I know you know made uh, you know seasons not great for Dan at times, um, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I'm going with uh, Ray Lewis, the Ravens as my defense, and then final pick. I need a flex, um, so I've got. Uh, let's see, there's one wide receiver on the board. I, B Scott, you've got your wide receiver, don't you? Uh, or do yep. you? Yep, you've got your wide I just receiver, Calvin Johnson. Yeah, you need your defense. So there's my only wide, one defense. <clears throat> True. So you're kind of pigeonholed into your last pick here. Um, so my pick, because the only running back left is Peyton Hillis, I'm going to go uh, wide receiver, uh, and I'm going to go with Larry Fitzgerald. Um, you know, just one of my favorite players, one of those guys that, you know, it doesn't matter, like, what team is your favorite team. Um, you know, that's you know that's one of the players that you idolize and, and, and root for. Um, unfortunate he wasn't able to ever get a Super Bowl. We made it to the Super Bowl, I think, in Super Bowl forty three against the Steelers, uh, where the Cardinals almost won that one. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, Larry Fitzgerald, one of my favorite players, and that's how I'll finish out the draft. So I don't have much of an option, but it's okay because this was actually the defense I was going to go with. I am going with Richard Sherman and the Seahawks defense from two thousand fifteen. The Legion of Boom, and yeah, I'm glad this one was the one that was only one was available because this is definitely the one I was going to take. It was a fun defense to watch; they just flew all over the field. Um, and you know, I honestly they really made Peyton Manning look really bad in a Super Bowl. <laughs> so, and that's really not easy to do to make Peyton Manning look as bad as he did in that game. Um, so, yeah. I think I think that's a good final pick to be able to get the Legion of Boom. Oh yeah, and no Antonio Brown, Craig. No, you don't, I, you don't yeah. want somebody that's going to quit on you in the second quarter. I, no, I would prefer. Hey, you know what? He did leave uh, leave us with a pretty good meme, which was every day is a, uh, every day is a half day if you just leave early. That's that's <laughs> those are the worth other still... one I heard. All we wanted from 2022 was just a little bit of normalcy. Here's January 2nd, and there's Antonio Brown <laughs> dancing at the end zone half naked. All right. Yep. Okay, I have to know, is the picture of him, of the picture somebody posted that looks like him standing outside the stadium waiting for an Uber, is that a legitimate picture? I don't know. Because I know he didn't go far because he, was, he stayed within the area because he was at the Nets game last night. Yeah, I have sitting, sitting courtside. I have so. no idea. All I've seen is a TikTok of like his Uber driver, and I don't not even one hundred percent sure if that's real. So I have no idea what happened. Yeah, I was hoping. I, just heard... I was going to. I was going to say. I was hoping we'd find some cell phone like footage of like the fight that like took place, so, like the whole reason why you know that whole thing happened, or like the argument or something. That's what I've been waiting for. There I've is been wanting... there is like Mike Evans trying to calm him down. Right. Is there... that footage. But there wasn't really much of a fight. It was just he thought he was too injured to go back in. Bruce Arians wanted him to go back in. He said, no, I'm not going back in. So Bruce Arians told him to to leave. Yeah, I've, I've, heard, I've heard mixed reports. Though. Is that the official one? Because I've also heard that like he had some incentives on the line and they weren't playing him. because. Oh, yeah. He, I mean, he, he had, a, I think, the incentives that were on the line. I mean, he was being asked to go back in the game and he said no. So it's like, OK, is he? passing up on these incentives or is it true that they weren't playing him so he wouldn't hit those incentives right i don't know i don't think we will ever truly know no yeah it seemed like there was a lot of different stories going around but i mean it's just uh you know unfortunately he's you know gone through a lot of things it seems like there's you know some issues unresolved issues there and it's like I mean, the last you know four teams he's been with, he hasn't finished the season with them. So it's kind of like, 
yeah, there's, there's always something going on there, but uh, yeah. And I heard something like he was trying to get a ride to the airport, but then didn't have his ID and stuff like that with him. So I, I, so that's why he was sticking around, didn't have like his wallet. And so, I mean, there's a bunch of stories. It's just kind of hard to tell what's going on, but it's just kind of a, kind of a sad, sad end. If it is the end for his career that kind of went that way. I mean, he had some, had, had some pretty great seasons with the Steelers, but uh, unfortunately that had to end as well. I mean, Craig, didn't we get to see him up close and personal? I don't think he was, maybe we did. I don't I think remember. it was right at the end of his. Probably. Yeah. Oh I no. Like, I think I did at Purdue. Yeah. Cause they always, yeah. Yeah. I think, there was I think it time. was, yeah. I think it was just after we left. Or maybe he, he was Central the, Michigan, right? Yeah, yeah, he yeah. went to Central yeah. Michigan. Yeah, because there was a, a season. Um, it was Dan Lefevre was his quarterback, and Purdue played Central Michigan three times within one calendar year. They geez. started the year off. They played him in a bowl game. Then they started again the next season. And I remember the bowl game. Um, he got a he, personal foul uh, for taunting or something in the bowl game. I remember that because yeah. whenever they drafted him, I remember actually watching that uh, bowl game. And I think that was the bowl game that Purdue won on like a, a late last second field goal yeah. too. Cause it was a back and forth game because Purdue just couldn't stop them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why the Colts drafted Dan Lefevre for a while. I had him on the <laughs> roster for a while. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, I think I have a final pick, right? Yeah. You do got, have the last uh, pick yeah. and you have the, I, I, the I, only player that you can take is yeah, Antonio Brown. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. yeah so, exactly. uh, after, after looking at all my choices here, uh, I think I'm going to go with AB uh, Antonio Brown. Uh, I think he'll be a great addition to the team. Look forward to him being with us for half for a season. Five seasons. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how things turn out. <laughs> All right, so that concludes it. A lot of here's the players still left on the board: Peyton Hillis, and then a lot of quarterbacks. That's why I like almost didn't take a quarterback into the last round because I was like, I mean, there's 11 of them. Uh, you know, Culpepper, McNabb, Young, Favre, Brady. Uh, no Patrick Mahomes, uh, and then Peyton Hillis. So Peyton Hillis because is feeling nobody wants to deal with Pat Mahomes' wife or his brother. True, true. Rather um, would deal with uh, AB. So my. Know. So my picks were OBJ, Marshall Falk, Lamar Jackson, uh, the Ravens defense, and Larry Fitzgerald. B. Scott's picks were Drew Brees, uh, Calvin Johnson, uh, Rob Gronkowski, Sean Alexander, and the Seahawks defense. And then Dan um, had uh, Barry Sanders. Uh, he had Michael Vick. He had the Steelers defense, Eddie George, and Antonio Brown. So not too bad. You know, a lot of great athletes, a lot of great memories with those Madden games. You guys showed a ton of love on TikTok this year, especially when it came to our high school football content. So with that, enjoy our most watched TikTok and the segment from which it came. The hot or cold question is this. Center Grove is the team to beat in 6A. And in my opinion, that is a cold take. Uh, Center Grove quarterback Taven Jackson is off to Tennessee. Caden Curry is headed to Ohio State. They also lose running back Daniel Weems. Uh, who was the second uh, leading rusher in the last two seasons. They also have to contend with a team that has played them really tough when they've matched up the last couple of years, and that is Cathedral. Cathedral moves up to 6A after winning the last two uh, state championships at 5A. Yeah, I agree. This is definitely a cold take. I mean, it is, it's tough to replace your quarterback, to have a defensive lineman headed to the Big Ten. But Cathedral just has so much returning from these dominant teams that they've had here as of late. Yes, I know it's now they're up in 6A. They were a 6A team even back in 5A. Let's, be, let's just be honest. And let's not wait any longer. Let's go ahead and hop into it. Uh, first, we're going to start with 6A. Um, it's going to be a, an exciting season there. A, it's a always class, exciting in 6A. Right. A class that last the last two years has been dominated by Center Grove. Um, and so that's where we're going to start, hot or cold. We're going to give a hot or cold uh, take for each class. That's, of course, a segment of the show where we uh, give a take and say whether or not it's a hot take or a cold take. And for 6A, the hot or cold question is this. Center Grove is the team to beat in 6A. And in my opinion, that is a cold take. Uh, Center Grove quarterback Taven Jackson is off to Tennessee. Caden Curry is headed to Ohio State, departing from a defense that was ranked 14th in the state. They also lose running back Daniel Weems. 
uh, who was the second uh, leading rusher the last two seasons, uh, and they're two leading receivers. Uh, and, you know, they also have to contend with a team that has played them really tough when they've matched up the last couple of years, and that is Cathedral. Cathedral moves up to 6A after winning the last two uh, state championships at 5A. Um, and so, um, you know, and they've, they've been impressive. They have an impressive resume against 6A schools the last couple of years. They're always a power regardless. Um, but they beat state runner-up Westfield 14 to nothing last season. They beat Brownsburg 20 to seven. They defeated Penn 37 to nothing. They led Center Grove at halftime last year. Took a 14 point. It took a 14 point fourth quarter by the Trojans uh, to finally pull away 21 to six. And most importantly, Cathedral returns quarterback Danny O'Neill, who had nearly 3,000 yards uh, passing last season. That was top 10 in the state. He had 33 touchdowns, two interceptions. They also uh, bring back my guy, my uh, 3C Media Male Player of the Year, Jerron Tibbs. Uh, He's their leading receiver. They also bring back Carson Johnson, their leading rusher. So, I mean... There's a lot of talent that comes back to that Cathedral team, and I think that gives them the edge to just be a little bit better than Center Grove. Center Grove's still going to come back strong. They're one of those teams that's always good, but I think Cathedral now, with the talent they have moving up to 6A, kind of makes them the team to be in that class. Yeah, I agree. This is definitely a cold take. I mean, you, when you look at 6A, it's it's usually a handful of teams that are, are always good up there it's the Carmels, the ben davises the warren centrals the center groves um but now you have you know cathedral joining the for the the race for 6a and it is it's tough to replace your quarterback you know it's tough to replace especially senior leaders cc team (laughs) right that and then to have a defensive lineman headed to the big 10 as well. I mean, those two things right there are, are, they're, they're tough to replace. I mean, replacing senior leaders is always going to be tough, but replacing that level of talent is, is tough. I mean, center Grove, if there's a team that can do it, it is a program that can do it. It is center Grove. Um, But cathedral just has so much returning from these dominant teams that they've had here as of late. Yes. I know it's now they're up at six, a, they were a 6A team even <laughs> back in 5A. Let's be, let's just be honest. Um, one thing I'm going to be interested, though, with Center Grove, isn't this the first year? Are, are they still in the MIC, or is this their first year out of the MIC? I know, there was, a big, I know there was a big storyline of them moving away, I thought. I thought they that basically the like kind of were told, but got voted out, but decided to leave the MIC. I don't know. Really, it – so – I want to, I'm interested to know what their schedule looks like this season if they're not in the mic and how, I mean, they usually typically play Cathedral anyways, but it'll be interesting because really the goat running through the gauntlet of the mic really helps a team like Cathedral, like, like Center Grove prepare for the state tournament run. Let's see, Center Grove, you're a little bit more of an aficionado for the Mick than I am, so I'll just run through the schedule. They they open uh, with Warren Central, then they play Carmel. They're at Louisville Trinity, uh, then they're at Ben Davis. They have North Central, Warren Central. They're still in the Mick. Okay. <laughs> they're still in the Mick. Okay. I thought <laughs> at I... least they may not be considered part of the Mick conference, but their schedule is at least Mick right. conference. Well, it's, it's, it's... It's everybody. Because I remember seeing a story about that, but maybe it was them. Maybe it's the, like, a couple years from now. Yeah, maybe that's, that's what I was going to say. Maybe it's in like a couple seasons. We're, we're just getting so much conference realignment confused <laughs> yeah, yeah. on all levels. Center Grove is going to be joining the Big Ten pretty soon. And <laughs> at this rate, playing USC. Cathedral, Cathedral will be knocking on the door of the yeah. Big Ten before we know it. I mean, they've already got a wide receiver headed to the Big Ten and a future quarterback that's most likely headed to the Big Ten as well. So, but yeah. It's going to get sniped uh, by the Pac-12. <laughs> the Pac-12 needs to steal some teams. Maybe. Yeah, so I think this is definitely a cold take. I think there are some other teams that are um, could be looked at as the team to beat as well, but obviously you got to look at, as, at Cathedral hands down already. Yeah, for sure. Um, so looking at uh, the toughest sectional, um, you know, from that class, because 
one thing, just kind of like in in actual in like college football uh, as well, conferences really don't matter, um, it, especially not in high school football. Um, I mean, they they matter for pride and and, and that kind of thing, bragging yeah. rights. But other than Rivalries. that, it's more about the sectional because that's who obviously you're going to be playing come postseason play. Um, and so we're going to take a look at the toughest sectional, uh, and in my opinion. It's sectional four. We talked about it a little bit uh, before we started recording. Uh, you've got Westfield. Uh, they're the back-to-back state runner-ups. They finished ranked number two in 6A last season. You've got Carmel. They're always good. They finished ranked number four last season uh, in 6A. They've had at least 10 uh, wins in eight of the last 10 seasons. You've got Zionsville, who was the 5A runner-up the last two seasons. Um, and, you know, now Carmel and, and Westfield especially have lost – now, you know, they have lost a lot of talent, Carmel and Westfield uh, have, but, you know, it's going to be the most interesting sectional, to say the least. You're going to have all this talent, all these teams, um, that any one of these, if you were to tell me that's your state finals pick, I'd be like, okay, that makes sense. Um, but, you know, maybe except for maybe Zionsville. I don't know if Zionsville can get there. I mean, I they mean, could. They could. It's Right. If you can come out of this sectional. Right. There's no reason you can't. I mean, the question is, though, I just want to know, like, how, with the addition of Cathedral and Zionsville now, what what is the pairing in the matchups like for for regionals, yeah. for semi-state? That really, because it's like, is, you know, is the winner of the, the sectional Cathedral's in and the winner of this sectional, are they like bound to play each other prior to the state championship. I mean, it's, I, I, I don't know these. Yeah. We don't know how the bracket, how the bracket shakes out. I don't, I I don't, I mean, I always, always used to be under the assumption that it was like North and South. That's how it always broke up. And and it was the, the North South cutoff line was Marion County, Hamilton County, which was why Carmel, always had such an easy path to the state championship was because they never had to go through Ben Davis, Center Grove, or Warren Central to get there. All they had to go through was like Penn. And well, okay. But I don't know how it all shakes out now. It's so mi- mixed up. Maybe it still is that way. I I, I don't know. It is, but that sectional though, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be a bloodbath uh, no matter oh, what. Yeah. You've got so many good teams in that sectional. Yeah, I totally agree. I wanted to go in a different direction, but then I looked because I was like, oh, I have the perfect one. It's going to be sectional six because that's where they're gonna put Cathedral and Warren Central is in that sectional. I was wrong. <laughs> War- the what, the school that got the bump from sectional six to allow Cathedral to come in was Warren Central. So sectional six is now Cathedral, Lawrence Central, Lawrence North, and North Central. I mean, the toughest competition there is probably North Central yeah. or Lawrence North for Cathedral. Which, and I mean, that so, kind of makes sense because I know they're, those four teams are all in the same basketball sectional, so it kind of makes sense. Yeah, and they honestly, they are all within about a 15-minute bus ride from each other. Right. I mean – Lawrence Central and Cathedral are literally down the street from each other. <laughs> 56th Street. Uh, Lawrence North and North Central, pretty much the same thing. I mean, you just hop on 82nd Street, go straight through Castleton, and then and Keystone at the crossing, and boom. You you can I mean, that's a 10 minute, 10 minutes apart. Um, I mean, my wife went to North Central and I went to Lawrence North. We grew up 10 minutes apart from each other. So it same thing there and then Lawrence Central and Lawrence North obviously they're just like right around the corner from each other so all it, it does make sense I mean I I guess out of all of these sectionals I mean these schools have like the shortest bus rides to go anywhere but yeah I mean sectional four for 6a is going to be the it's a it's a bloodbath whoever comes out of that I feel like has a really strong chance of making a state championship run to face cathedral <laughs> Um, we we're also going to look at some uh, players to watch here. 
Uh, for 6A, for me, my player to watch going into the season is Brownsburg quarterback Jaden Whitaker. Uh, he was fourth in total yards in 6A last season. He had 1,500 yards passing, nearly 500 yards rushing. He completed 66% of his passes, uh, 10 touchdowns uh, uh, through the air, seven on the ground. Uh, there's a lot of offensive talent returning on the Bulldogs team that finished number five in 6A last season, and I think Whitaker can have a big year. I think that's another team that I think can have a, a really strong uh, season this year is Brownsburg. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, yeah, that's a good pick. For me in 6A, I mean, Jerron Tibbs is going to be really interesting out of Cathedral. I mean, he has a chance to be – the number one right wide receiver in the state of Indiana. I mean, he's he's already committed to go to Purdue. And he's going to have a lot of eyes on him now, being especially being up in 6A. Um, Danny O'Neill, the quarterback at Cathedral, is another one to really keep an eye on as well because he is an up and coming junior that's getting starting to get a lot of Division One heavy looks. Um, also, I'm I'm going to go with uh, Purdue commit from Westfield, Dylan Thieneman. Um, yeah, Westfield lost a lot. You know, they, they're still back-to-back state runner-up finishes for them. This defense of Westfield is going to be still really good and led by Dylan Thieneman. Um, yes, he's the third of the – he's the youngest of the three Thieneman brothers that have all played at Purdue, but apparently he's the best of all of them. Um, so, yeah, it's it's going to be – a fun season to watch of what these, some of these players, but those are the three players I'm keeping my eye on the most, just because I feel like some of them are up and coming. Some of them have kind of come out of nowhere. And then some of them are going to have big targets on their backs. So I'm interested to watch all three of those players, especially the seniors, see how they finish out their careers. I mean, you got the Westfield players, that are hungry for that. They've been there. They've come up short every time they've been there the past two years. So how, how is that going to play out for them? Cathedral, are they just going to assert their dominance? And these players from Cathedral just assert their dominance and cement their legacy in 6A as well? It's, it's not really just the players, but the storylines that I'm really looking at for 6A. Yeah, I mean Westfield. I think too. Last year was really close. Like that was a that was a down to the wire game against Center Grove. So I, cause I think it was a little bit more lopsided the first time around. So to be that close both times is pretty uh, pretty crazy. Um, so dark horse and state champ for six A. Uh, my dark horse is gonna be Brownsburg. Uh, they finished ranked number five in six A last season. They fell to Ben Davis in the regionals. They you know like I mentioned before, they return one of the more dynamic players in Jaden Whitaker. Uh, he, they also bring back leading rushers Garrett Sherrill and Caleb Marcus, are, uh, which both they both had uh, over 900 yards rushing uh, last season. Whitaker only threw one touchdown to a senior last se- season, meaning a lot of his targets are coming back. Um, and this is a Brownsburg team that's going to be tough again this season, and, and I think they can be strong enough to contend for a state title. But ultimately, though, as far as state championship is concerned, I'm going with Cathedral. It's really tough to not go Cathedral. Uh, they return one of the best passers in the state who uh, only will get better in his junior season. Yeah, by the way, Danny O'Neill was only a sophomore last year when he lit 5A on fire. Uh, you know, his top target, Jerron Tibbs, we've mentioned him countless times on the podcast. Uh, you know, he's back. Their defense was top five in the state last year in terms of points per game. And if they can carry that over into 2022, I mean, they're going to be tough no matter what class you put them in. Um, I'm going with Cathedral to be the, the state champs when it's all said and done. Yeah, uh, you know, my dark horse, I am, I'm looking at, um, it, it's, I, I I don't really know if you can consider them a dark horse because they're always within the mix, but I'm looking at Carmel. Uh, this defense of Carmel is going to be really strong. Honestly, when you're looking at the, the, the powerhouse that that cathedral is and looking at that offense, you need to look at these teams that are going to have strong defenses. If you want to look at somebody that can, def- that can take out cathedral, I'm, I'm looking at the Westfields. I'm looking at Carmel's because they they have teams that are going to be really solid on defense this year. Um, So for me, my dark horse is Carmel. Just based on their defense, they have a really strong defensive line and linebacking core, and I'm really anxious to see the matchup between them and Cathedral Um, because I feel like if you can disrupt – I mean, if you can disrupt that Cathedral offense any kind of way, 
you it gives you a fighter's chance. But yeah, uh, I mean, if you don't already know who I'm going with in six A, <laughs> you haven't been listening. Cathedral is my pick. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and Carmel is a good dark horse because I mean, you you list off. I feel like there's you know we did a tier list last year for the NFL teams like Super Bowl contenders on from there, and I think for six A, I mean, Carmel definitely is in that state title tier, but they're kind of in that like they're barely on that cutoff as far as like you've got center grove you've got cathedral you've got westfield i would consider them kind of teetering on that edge of being a step lower to contender as far as like here are my teams that are locks here's my teams that i think they're going to be in the mix carmel i think would be more in that second tier so i think that is a good dark horse i think i consider them kind of on the same level as brownsburg is they they're a team that's always good but they lost a little bit of talent we'll see how they shape up this year and of course you know that it's been what a couple seasons since they've been to the state championship so it's not as if yeah. you know they're they're you know in their early 2010s ways of always being there so that definitely right. is a good pick hey if, if, by the way if anybody's going to be heading out to any westfield games uh, i'll be out there for a couple times this season definitely let me know if you're going to be out there and yeah i'm good I live right down the street. I live right down the street from Westfield High School now. So got to support the local community. Hope you guys enjoyed our best of 2022 episode. We here at 3C Media are so grateful for the love and support you guys have shown us over this past year. And we hope you'll be with us again in 2023. Have a safe and happy new year.